Hi, my name is Debbie, and I am an alcoholic. This has been awesome. You know, I got to second everything that everybody said about getting involved and being a part of this convention committee. I mean, you, what sobriety, and what a different perspective you have looking at all the sobriety here. It's absolutely awesome. I've been the host, and I've really enjoyed meeting the people that I've met, being a, a one among many. You know, we have titles, but we all do a little bit of everything to get this going. This year has had its challenges, as, as I'm sure you all are aware of. And um, God bless Dave. He got the phone call, like, what, two weeks ago that there was a bit of construction and people were going to be moved. And as Tom has alluded many times, the parking issue, um, and be careful, your, t your car is not going to get towed and all that good stuff. This convention is definitely going to go down in history, Dave, you know, and I hope everybody is getting what you need to get out of it. It's up to you to go out there and get it. Um, I'm, I'm the host of the chair, and what I do after the powers that be finally make the decision to finally have the final, you know, invited guest, we, we go through an interim process, and I'm given the name, and I, I usually send a little card by mail, you know, introducing them to me and welcoming and thanking them for being agreeing to come to our little Rhode Island conference and follow it up with a long, lengthy email all about me, you know, in hopes. <laughs> and, and, and the purpose of that is to share who I am, so that opens the door for them to share with me who they are, you know. Um, and then keep sharing, and, and I still stay in contact with some of the, the people, the, the past people that we have had speakers, which is awesome. And, and our friend from California, who is joined by his wife, um, I sent him an email, and he didn't respond. I sent him another email, and he didn't respond. And then I sent him, like, a third or fourth email, and he said, I'm, you're on the list, said, Cool. So this guy has so much to tell me and share about himself. He's going to send me little blurbs daily about himself so I'll know exactly what to say. And, you know, if I get it daily, then I can remember better than all in once, like, you know, my thing. But, however, you know, my story is written, and you can print it and reread it if you want to. Not, you know, it's not about me, though. But in any event, he never did that. He never, he never shared himself with me. However, I I am on his list, and I get emails daily, um, twice a day, Dave, uh, three times a day, uh, um, often. And what these emails are are little quotes, and ironically timing every time I open his email, and I don't always open them all the time right away, but it is exactly what I need. Funny how that works, you know. Um, but little by slowly, I started reading all these emails that he sent me. And one of them was celebrating the 10th anniversary in Mongolia, you know, inviting him to go to their 10th year of celebrating AA in Mongolia, you know. I don't even know where that is, but cool. I, I got it on my, I'm on the list, you know. I feel important. I'm one among many. Then there's 60 years in Finland. You know, I said, wow, who is this guy? You know, I can't wait to meet him. And, and, but I, I, he came early, so I didn't have to go to the airport and pick him up. And then he rented a car, and I got really excited. I have to tell you, on Friday, he called, said he needed a ride from the car rental. And I said, oh, cool, in Newport. First of all, it was going to be at the airport, and then, then he found a place in Newport, which he thought would be more convenient. So I was all excited to go pick him up, use that quality time, what, five or ten minutes, to drive here. However, I was going to go this, through the scenic view of Newport, which is very pretty if you come at the right time. But um, anyway, I told you I have an, I'm an alcoholic. I need to explain it all. You know, I'm getting to the point you want me to announce. Okay. I, I, I remember that. Anyway, he called and he didn't need me to come. He got a ride. And I was crushed. I thought, okay, well, I'm not even going to even know what he looks like when I get here. And then I get here all stressed out, making sure everybody was here. And then the people that were supposed to pick up some, I wasn't even sure everybody was here. So I got a little frantic. And then I met him, finally. And I met his wife, finally. And, and what, I, what I gathered in the times that I have spent with him is his passion in sharing AA all over. 
We're everywhere. Look at the group that we're, that's here. South Africa, you know, how AA spread in South Africa. Um, and it's, it's actually a pleasure being on his listserv. I can't really tell you much about him except that he's <laughs> tall and charming and handsome and brilliant. And what else? <laughs> it, it, it's been a pleasure. I, I had dinner with them. Finally, I got to spend some time with them, and, um, and, and I enjoyed meeting his wife and meeting him. And what, what a gift. You know, you don't drink, and you go to meetings, you hang on, you get on the list, you know. What more can you ask for, you know? Anyway, I would like you guys now from Rhode Island and everywhere else to give a warm, welcome, hearty Rhode Island welcome to our faraway California close. And the weather's beautiful there, might I add. It's on his answer machine on his cell phone. I had to remind him he was in Rhode Island. But in any of it, welcome, Bill from California. Thank you. For a short girl, she can go on. Huh? <laughs> <clears throat> Bill, alcoholic. Yeah. It's cold out there. Um, I'm going to fill out one of those questionnaires, you know, about how the roundup went. I'm going to have one suggestion. May. May, not March, May. Don't yell at me. I'm a little touchy. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's uh, shocking to be surprised, uh, surrounded by so many people that have the general service problem. Uh, it's like too many delegates in one room. Uh, little, you people must do AA correctly here because all the cops are here. <laughs> you know? I don't believe for a second that our cop, the sheriff, is going to retire. You know what they do? Old cops never retire. They just manipulate from behind the scenes. <laughs> Let's see, what's true? Um, a weird thing happened to me in March of 1985. Well, I should start off the way you guys do. My sobriety date is March the 27th, just recently, 1985. Yeah. My home group is a Hermosa Beach. Thank you. My home group is a Hermosa Beach men's stag. It's where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. We are absolutely politically incorrect, as we are supposed to be in California. We sing happy birthday. We put candles on cakes. We take cakes all week long. It's all about us all the time. You know? And uh, I was sharing at one of these things, and a guy named Keith Lewis that just recently passed away. Some of you might have known him. He's a great guy. He got up, I spoke on a Friday night, and he spoke on Saturday night, and he started off his pitch by saying, Bill, are you in the audience? I said, yes. He says, I want to report to you. I want you to understand Alcoholics Anonymous did not start in Southern California. You know? So, but we carry that attitude around with us wherever we go. You know? That's our job is to be a big target. And uh, so a strange thing happened to me in March of 85. I got struck sober. And uh, it's a, what an odd experience. It's an odd experience, isn't it? I mean, most of us, we all tell the story about how we got sober. We talk about what happened right up to the point. Rarely do you hear the guy was in the drunk tank and he made this plea to God to save him, and then he never drank again. Every once in a while you'll hear something like that. But mostly I think most of us just fall over from the sheer exhaustion of the lifestyle, you know. <laughs> 
You know, we, we just kind of stumble in and just fall down, you know. And, you know, some of us do it a bunch of times, and then finally we just don't drink, and we walk around the rest of our life bemused, you know. And what the hell, you know. In, in March of 1985, that happened to me. You know, I, I, the obsession got taken away, and I haven't drank since. And it's just an odd thing. And what happens to us, I believe, when that happens is we are truly awakened. We wake up. Some people never wake up. But there's a room full of us here tonight where we were awakened. And I believe the rest of the journey that we're on here is to take that awakening, that remarkable experience that happens to very few human beings of any stripe, we take that remarkable experience and we turn it in, hopefully, to some kind of an awareness of the awakening, where we are conscious of the fact that that happens and we live an examined life. That takes a while. That takes a while. Uh, a friend of mine some years ago, a friend of mine got hooked up in our, in our travel together in the 11th step of trying to make some kind of a relationship with this manager we got involved in Eastern philosophy, and this friend of mine got uh, involved with this Indian guru, quite a, an interesting man. And he came over to the United States, and he was giving a series of talks. And my friend called up and said, would you like to come and sit with Ramesh for And I went, that'd be really cool. So he gives this talk, and we, we're sitting in this back room, just the three of us together. And I'm talking away, and this guru looks at me and starts laughing <laughs> like that's, they laugh at us. You know, and I said, what are you laughing about? And he goes, I just love you alcoholics and drug addicts. And I go, why is that? And he goes, well, the rest of them out there are trying to get awakened. You're just trying to figure out what the hell happened. <laughs> you know? Now, isn't that true? I mean, the most undeserving people in the world, you know? I mean, it wasn't like we were sitting around studying. <laughs> Did any of you watch that play? <clears throat> Wasn't that a classic alcoholic play? <laughs> They're walking around holding the script, getting it wrong. Completely oblivious to the audience, getting a big kick out of each other. You know? I thought that was perfect. Perfect. The scarecrow was editing on the fly, too. My journey in AA didn't begin in March of 85, though. My journey in Alcoholics Anonymous really began in March of 1954. My father got fired from a job, and uh, rather than go to the bar, he came home. And it was probably my mother that called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he went to a meeting in Inglewood, California. And he came back from that meeting and he told my mother, he says, you know, those people have got something down there and I'm going to go back and find out what it is. So the next night, my mother went with him in order to monitor the experience. <laughs> and she walked in this little clubhouse with my dad and this woman ran right up to my mother and asked her why she was there. And my mother says, well, I'm here to make sure he fills out the form and pays the dues and buys the book. <laughs> and this woman took my mother into the other room. <laughs> don't make Al-Anon jokes if you don't know what it is. I'm serious. If you don't know what it is, don't make the jokes. A lot of people make dumbass Al-Anon jokes. So they don't get it. But if you know what it is, you can make some great Al-Anon jokes. <laughs> <clears throat> St 
stop and think of the consciousness of an individual that would live with us on purpose. <laughs> what are they thinking? <laughs> oh, this will be fun. <clears throat> when my father died in 1999, he was 45 years sober. And when my mother died in 2002, she was 48 years in Al-Anon. And she helped found the Al-Anon central office of the intergroup in Los Angeles. And uh, we hung out with Chuck Chamberlain and met Bill Wilson and all that stuff. I grew up in one of those god-awful AA houses. <laughs> there is nothing worse than living in a house with two people with clear eyes <laughs> that know exactly what's going on in your head. That's called hell. <clears throat> I'd come home from school and there'd be some guy laying on the back porch waiting for his sponsor to come home. Usually drunk, you know. And uh, one day I came home, there was an Al Anon. There was a woman hiding in the garage. That was the Al Anon, you know. Waiting for her sponsor to come home, you know. And uh, this was before the hospitals figured out how to make money out of us. And when he went on a 12-step call, you brought him home. There was nowhere else to take him. Hospitals are for sick people. And uh, my dad used to tell this story. I have no idea what's it's true, but it's a good story. And uh, he said that him and Joe Motes, this guy, he had, uh, they had a drunk out in the parking lot of Harbor General Hospital. And they wouldn't take him in, so they took him out in the parking lot and ran over his foot with the car. <clears throat> no. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's true, but I bet they did something. You know, there's some basis in fact, you know. Probably slapped him around a little or something, you know. And, uh... But I grew up in that house. I grew up with all the potlucks and the barbecues and holding your hands after the end of meetings, going, keep coming back, it works. You know? <laughs> and I'd bring out the coffee and the donuts and, uh, you know, we had an old guy, one of these AA houses where there's all these weird uncles hanging out. You know, I mean, we had this weird uncle named Harold and he became like part of the family. He was like a member of our family. And Harold was on the back porch a lot, and Harold was drunk most of the time, and he had no car, and he didn't have a job, and my dad would give him jobs around the house and get money in his pocket and get him some clothes and take him to meetings, and we would feed him and stuff, you know. And here's a good description of hell. You're, you're, you're laying on the back porch. You're hung over horribly. It's a hot day, and you're laying on the concrete, and you're waiting for the sponsor to come home, and there's a little nine-year-old kid in your ear going, you know, you're not supposed to drink. <laughs> That's hell. <laughs> and, uh, finally, Harold got sober, and he got a car, and he got a job, and he cleaned up, and he started showing up at the house, and he was looking good, and, you know, going to meetings, and, and, uh, and he met a woman in AA, and I went to the wedding when they got married. And then he got drunk, and then he got fired, and I went to his funeral when he burned himself up alive, smoking in bed in a hotel room. I was 13 years old, and I knew that the reason that man died was because he drank. It wasn't an accident. I knew why he, why he died. I knew that alcohol had killed him. I knew that. I was clear about that. I understood it. You know, I lived in a house where the big books were open. People talked about it openly. I mean, there was lots of people, all the other AA kids around, and, you know, going to the conventions and all that stuff, you know. But, you know, to me, when you're a kid, it's just the stupid stuff your parents are doing. You know, I mean, it's like, it wasn't like I had a sponsor and I was reading the book, you know. I mean, it's like, I mean, you're just there, you know, going where they go until you can get the hell away. You know? and, uh, and I remember waiting around to drink. Remember waiting? You know, a couple of the speakers that talked about, you know, you have a few beers every now and then. Finally, you do it. Finally, you get it done. And I was late 14, maybe early 15 years old, and my friend and I had an older brother, and we... we 
they had a party and we drank a bunch of stuff and caused some trouble at the party and they threw me in this car and they drove me back to my parents' house and dumped me out on the front lawn. And I crawled in the house and down the hallway and got into the bed. I'm laying on the bed and I got one foot on the floor to stop the spinning. <laughs> and back in those days, we had these big black plastic things called records. <laughs> I'm serious. We had records. <laughs> had a little hole in it, right, in the middle. And we played them on pieces of furniture called record players. <laughs> <clears throat> and some of these pieces of furniture had lids on them. So I puked in the record player. <laughs> and I crawled back down the hall into the bathroom, and I'm sitting on the toilet with a trash can between my legs, because by this time it's coming out both ends. <laughs> bathroom door opens up. I look up, and there's my mother standing there with this aghast expression on her face, and my father standing behind her laughing hysterically. <laughs> And both of them knew, and oh my God, it begins. It begins. And it's not cute, is it? It's not cute when you have a kid that starts to kill himself quickly. Um, I didn't know there was a line. I never stepped over a line. I never knew one was there. Uh, I drank for effect immediately. My life stopped immediately. Nothing happened after that. Nothing happened. My life stopped. And every one of us talks about the feeling we had when we were kids that we didn't feel part of, that we didn't feel connected, that we felt odd or out of place. We talk about that like it's some special kind of feeling, like nobody else feels that way. We talk about it. We even call that alcoholism. People will say, I had alcoholism before I ever drank. I don't believe that. I think all kids feel that way. Some may be worse than others, but all kids feel like that. It's part of the rite of passage. You feel out of place. Everybody else is big. You're short. You know, they get to do stuff you can't, you know. You got zits and you got small breasts and you got problems, you know, and you want to look different. You want to be different. You listen to all the advertising and you don't look like anybody on television, you know. You feel out of place. You feel abnormal. You feel weird. The difference between every other kid and you and I is we medicated that. We medicated that, therefore, we never got beyond it. We stayed in it. And here we are now. <laughs> Party! <laughs> so then we drink. It alters our consciousness. Suddenly, we look like those people on TV. You know, now we're bigger, we're stronger, we're better, we're better looking, we speak better, we're smarter. You know, and we get that feeling. And the difference between us and everybody else that has a couple of beers is we have a different experience than they do. If they had the same experience we did, they would do it too. We metabolize it a bit differently. And we enter a new time zone, you know. All the promises come true, all at the same time, you know. And it's heaven. It's just heaven, you know. By the time I was 17, I was a bad drunk in high school. I was ir You couldn't talk to me. I had the big jacket and the slouch and the sneer and... The bad attitude and the foul mouth. I had a bit of a problem with authority. You know? And it was the 60s. It was appropriate. You know? I graduated from high school in 1965. You'll hear people say, I wouldn't trade my worst day sober for my best day drunk. I wouldn't trade 66 and 67 for anything. <laughs> From what I understand, it was a real hoot. <laughs> you know, I've read the books. I had a hell of a time. You know, I've looked at the magazines. I've recognized myself there. You know, it was cool. It was summertime all the time. You know, and uh, the road from Los Angeles to San Francisco was the road to Nirvana. 
Golden Gate Park was the center of the universe. And they weren't eating hitchhikers yet, so it was safe to travel. <laughs> you know. And the young ladies were discovering their sexuality, and we were helping them as best we could. <laughs> Aren't these bottles a little weird looking? <laughs> By the time I was 22, I was in the Oregon State Mental Institution. I needed to rest. <laughs> it's a big job changing the world. You know, and... Uh, In uh, 1965, on the 4th of July at Bass Lake, California, the Hells Angels rode into that valley, and I found my career path. <laughs> and uh, See, my story is I was a surfer and a biker and a tough guy, and I never went to the beach. <laughs> my motorcycle rarely ran, and I was afraid to fight, but I looked really good. And a chrome Nazi helmet for a hat and a primary chain for a belt and black greasy Levi's, big black boots with chains around them. I've got tattoos all over me. But I had a clip-on earring because I didn't want to hurt myself. I see there's a few more phonies in the room. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> uh, I met her at Bass Lake. She had long brown hair and she was well endowed. Then <laughs> we went to Oregon to grow our own. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we got married, I had two small children. Um, I was running with an outlaw motorcycle gang, sticking needles in my arm every day and drinking like a fish and not coming home to that family. They were on welfare, and, uh, and I was out getting loaded. And, uh, and I ended up in a mental institution. 22 years old. I'm in a mental institution. Anybody else here been in a mental institution? <laughs> oh, come on. There's a whole bunch of you out there going, well, it really wasn't an institution. <laughs> they, they were just observing me. <laughs> Only those of us that have been in a mental institution know that it's not that bad. <laughs> you have some sparkling conversations in the mental institution. <laughs> it's a great place to look for a bride. Kindred spirits. <laughs> Breathe. Uh, so I lost that family. I lost a wife. I lost two children. I lost a house. I lost a couple of cars. I lost several jobs. I'm 22 years old. And I'm in a mental institution. You know, we, we laugh about that now. The reason we laugh about it is because it's not like that now. When it's like that, it's not funny. My mother flew up from Oregon and drove me to that mental institution. I have to remember the way I ended up in the mental institution the first time was I called the police on myself. Now, there's a lot of people in general service here, and, and we have to admit something. There are no real issues in Alcoholics Anonymous. Therefore, we have to keep recycling the old ones <laughs> to give us something to do. And uh, one of the issues is the alcoholic and the addict, and are they the same, are they different, and all that whole stuff that goes around that. Well, anybody that's been out on the street knows that there's a difference between alcoholics and drug addicts. There's a very different personality. There's a distinct different personality. And there's just a difference. Everybody knows it. 
I will give you an operational definition of that difference. No self-respecting drug addict would ever call the police on himself. (laughs) But an alcoholic will do it and think that it's a pretty good idea. (laughs) There, There is a level of lameness in the alcoholic that simply does not exist in the hip, contemporary, rock and roll drug addict of today. All those in favor? I'm sure there's five or six people that can take that back to New York for us. Let them know the issue is over. You know, the children are coming in now. Do you get that here? Do you get the kids coming in now? The children are coming. How do we receive them? Do we receive them with open arms? Or do we generate an adversarial relationship like we did with the hospital programs years ago? Do we receive them in? In my men's stag, there's 110 guys every Monday night in that meeting. And I'll bet you that 40 to 50% of the room is under the age of 22 years old. The little bastards are taken over. <laughs> we had this kid not too long ago, about six months ago. He was, he's, was at the time, he was 15 years old. He was taking a one-year birthday cake in the big bad men's stag, right? And this kid stands up, all four feet of him, and he stands up in there, and he gave the most hard-ass right-wing AA pitch I have ever heard. We were, uh, we were stunned. We're sitting there listening to him, and at the end of his birthday, this is his birthday talk, he looked out in the room and he says, so if you're sitting out there now and you don't have a sponsor and you're not working the steps, may God have mercy on your soul. I went up to him after the meeting and asked him to be my sponsor. (laughs) For weeks after that, the rest of us are walking around looking at each other going, May God have mercy on your soul. (laughs) He is now the cleanup chairman at the meeting. Probably the most important job in AA. What Wilson and the old boys wanted was access to recovery for the population, access to recovery for anybody. When anyone anywhere reaches out, I want the hand of AA to always be there. For that I am responsible. Is that true or not? It's up to me to adapt myself to what comes in, not bitch and complain about how it's not correct. And these kids, when they started really coming in force, a lot of the old guys in my meeting left. And I thought about it. And then I realized something. I'm looking at myself. Nobody talked to me about recovery in 1968 when I was in that mental institution. Nobody brought it that I can remember. Nobody talked to me about it. Nobody addressed my problem as that I was strung out, drunk. You know, nobody said that. These kids get talked to about that a lot, all through school. They get, to, they know. You know, and they're sticking now. And all that has to happen is one of them walk up and ask you for help, and they did. They walked up and asked me for help, and I sat down there and I listened to them. Was it, was it my story? No. Did they end up in the same place in the incomprehensible demoralization, scared to death, feeling separated from the rest of the world and unable to have any kind of a healthy relationship with another human being? Absolutely. Absolutely. Then I realized that for a while I thought I was a father figure 
Then I realized, no, I'm a grandfather figure. <laughs> That's kind of sad. I'm sitting out in the front of my house one time. This is around Halloween time, and a bunch of these kids are hanging out at the house, and Karen cooks for them and feeds them. You know, they're always hungry. And uh, I have a 23-year-old son. My son comes up, and I'm sitting around in a circle with these guys on some old furniture we put out in the front yard. To, and, uh, you know, I mean, I know one thing. I don't have enough tattoos. I need, I need more tattoos. It's clear. My son comes up to me, and he leans over and whispers in my ear, and he goes, I didn't know you were hip. When did that happen? <laughs> I love the kids, man. They'll keep you young. You know? And they need our help. They need help, just like we needed when we came in. They need help. They want somebody to listen to them, somebody that will care about them, somebody that will read the book with them and work the steps with them and take them serious. But at 22, I wasn't ready. At 22, I could have used you. I needed you at 22, and I wasn't ready. I had another 15 years to go. I came back down to California, and uh, one of the requirements for being an alcoholic is that you must hate your parents. It's mandatory. And and I hated my father, especially my father. I didn't much like my mother either, but I hated my father. I mean, it was passionate. They sent me to my first psychiatrist when I was 13 because I had rage. and uh, Not anger, rage. Just rage at the injustice of it all. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a wall pounder and a head butter and, I, you know, veins throbbing in my neck and bile from my stomach into my throat and just throw myself on the ground, rage. And, uh, but when you need something, you can overlook certain things. And uh, I asked my dad for help, and he let me sleep in his garage, and he gave me a job in his machine shop in El Segundo, California. And I tried to get normal. And the first thing you got to do is you got to quit shooting heroin. You can't find anybody to go along with the concept of social heroin use. <laughs> Pretty much a lifestyle. You got to take you got to quit taking LSD because normal people have communication with each other. And uh, acid is not conducive to two-way communication. So you just have to stop doing that. So what you do is you drink on the weekends. You cannot drink during the week at all because Normal people have jobs that they show up to days in a row. I've watched them do it. You know, it's incredible. Week after week. And when I drink, I don't show up no matter what. I mean, literally, everything stops. And uh, so what you do during the week is you smoke pot because it's green and it's from God and it's not really drugs. You know, uh, Marijuana is what you do in between getting really high. It's just maintenance. Because I don't know about you, but the impact of your personality on me is devastating. I need something to cushion the blow of you on me, you know. You know, I just, I can't do you, you know. It's just like, you know, there has to be something in my system to kind of slow down the impact on me, you know. So I did this experiment for 15 years. As you can imagine, it failed miserably. The other thing about getting normal is you've got to find a woman um, <laughs> or a man. Um, but it's a group effort getting me through life. It takes a village. You know, and, it's a, and I'm just a high-maintenance guy. It's still like that now. And you can find volunteers that will take on your case. And I met this woman, we set up housekeeping, and we had two small children. I had two more children. And uh, by the time I was 37 years old, um, there was no more dope in my life. There were no more drugs. It was me in a gin bottle. There was no more mental and emotional relief. I was drunk from the neck down. It would get rid of the physical pain, but there was no more relief. You, know? you ever drank yourself clear? Boy, that was never the idea, was it? (laughs) That's another good definition of hell. I mean, people think we're joking when we say that it stopped working. It stops working. I'm not going away. I don't know what I look like to you. Maybe I'm just falling down drunk, but inside I am clear as a bell. I remember everything. I'm looking around. It's like 3D, boy. And I'm I'm drinking for the blackout. 
I want to go away. I don't like it here. And I'm not going away anymore. That's hell. And no more drugs, no more nothing, you know. And uh, I'm just drinking. And I'm 37. And I'm, I'm married and I'm living in the house with this woman and these two small children. And I have no emotional connection to another living human being. And I don't even know that. I can't stand outside myself and have a separate experience and engage it, compare it to the one that I'm having to determine how disconnected I am. I don't know that. I'm clueless that I'm completely disconnected. Silkworth says a really powerful thing in the doctor's opinion. He says, we lose touch with all things human. Isn't that true? We unplug. We're standing outside the circle. We're not part of of life. We're not part of what's going on around us. We're not connected to other human beings. So like any good gangster, I called my mom. I mean, the whole idea behind this drinking thing was to have a party, wasn't it? Wasn't that the initial, the initial thing was, remember before we were talking about disconnected, isolated zits and bad feeling bad, and you have a couple of drinks. The idea was to have a couple of drinks and get out of the house and go to the party, meet her or him, get lucky, and have some adventures. I ended up naked in my living room watching religious television, taking notes. <laughs> party! I'm having sex, menage a uno. <laughs> there is no one else in the room. You know. Next time you see somebody walk into AA that says, well, I'm just a party kind of guy, ask them, how many people were at the party? <laughs> party guy. It's the same thing, you know, I mean, the, the whole gangster thing. Next time you see some big badass guy walk into A, walk up to him and say, do you live with your mom? <laughs> chances are, chances are, mom's the only one left, you know. Big gangster me, there was no one else on the speed dial, you know. I mean, it was, uh, and just like she did when she came to Oregon and drove me to the mental institution, she came and got me and hauled me off to a place in Costa Mesa called Starting Point before I changed my mind. Quickly. Quickly. I told you that I went to my first shrink when I was 13. I've been in the mental institution a couple of times. I spent two and a half years in group therapy at one time. I've been to several other therapists and psychiatrists over the years. I've been gestalted and rolfed and primal screamed. I know more about myself than is safe to know. But it is my favorite subject. You know? I mean, you'd love to have me in your group. I'm really interactive, you know. I, I feign interest in you real well. You know? you know, it's, uh... So even though I got raised in AA and I'd been in the rooms, I couldn't imagine just coming to the meetings and not drinking. You know, I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine. Every one of us has gotten up in the morning after an especially eventful evening and looked in the mirror, if we can look at ourselves, which is difficult for many of us, and we've said to ourselves, we looked in the mirror and we look and we say, i got to cut this shit out. (laughs) And the very next thought is, I need a drink. (laughs) I mean, we know, we know. We know. We're not stupid. We're just alcoholics, you know. I mean, but we know. But you can't really imagine not drinking. It happens to me all the time, too. It's just that I'm so spiritual. <clears throat> Maybe it was because I cussed. (laughs) So I I, I couldn't just imagine going to the meeting. So I needed my MO is to check in somewhere and get some rest and more therapy. I need more therapy. You know, I'm just a sensitive, artistic kind of guy in a rough world, you know. And, and, uh, So I checked into this place. While I was in this place, they made me wear a sign around my neck. 
I had to make the sign. We made it in crafts. A little rectangular piece of cardboard with a string that went through it, and, and it said, I am not a counselor. Because evidently there was some confusion. So I spent 35 days in there, and, uh, and then they let us out. <laughs> they let us out. And go forth, multiply. You know. <laughs> Bless you, my child. Like we're okay, you know. Like we're all right now, you know. They let us go. Where do we end up? I work alone. <laughs> if, if the CD couldn't hear that, the guy said Rhode Island. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> that was a mistake. <clears throat> We end up in the world's aftercare program, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's linoleum floors and metal folding chairs for the rest of our natural lives. <laughs> Party! There are no referrals from AA. There's no place you go where you walk in and you say, I'm from AA, they sent me here. <laughs> that place doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. This is it. This is the last house on the street. You know? So I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a newcomer in AA. I'm a newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous. Something I'd been striving for most of my life. And uh, <clears throat> Have you ever had anybody say to you, he's not emotionally available for me? You ever heard that? You know what they mean by that? What they mean is, that I've got something that they want, and I'm withholding it. The truth is worse. I don't have it. And I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it. And I'm helping you look for it. <laughs> and this is going to go on forever. You know? Now, if you would like me to be emotionally available, if you would like me to be there for you, if you would like me to be able to be intimate with you, if you would like me to feel what you feel, and not just react to how you feel impacts me. If you would like that, real intimacy, if you would like that, it's going to take about 10 years. And I'll promise you something. If at the end of that 10 years I get sober, if all I do for that 10-year period is just go to meetings and work some steps Nothing will change. It won't even get a little bit better. I'll be standing in front of you, yelling at you, at 10 years sober, what the hell do you want from me? And the truth is, I don't know what you want from me. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I can't grasp it. And you can't describe it to me. And if you described it perfectly well to me, and I got it stuck in my head, so what? If I haven't had the experiences that are going to cause me to deepen as an individual. It is my contention that if I spend all the time in the past trying to find out the root cause of my problem, I am going to completely miss what I'm unfolding into today that has no connection to my past at all. 
This is a brand new life. It is not the extenuation of the old one. And all I've got in my head is the old one. I haven't had a new experience. So this deepening process, this growing up emotionally that happens around here, because when you and I started drinking, we stopped growing up. We stopped. We are that disaffected, unplugged, unconnected, sad, scared, frightened little kid that didn't feel part of when he was 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And I'm 40 years old and I'm that kid. On a good day, I've got the emotional development of a 16-year-old and this kid was not an honor student. (laughs) He was the one with the problem with authority. That's who I am today. That's what I bring to you today. So what's the purpose of this whole thing? What's the purpose? People talk about the program. Like, what's the program? What does it mean? What's the it? What are we looking for? What helps us? How does God work in our lives today to cause us to confront these defects of character and get to the other side of them so that we change and we deepen and we are able to feel what other people feel? Because our very lives depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our problem. If they were really serious about that, the absolute worst thing we can do is work on ourselves. That's the worst thing. Sparse applause. My sponsor told me, read the doctor's opinion, make notes in the margin, be at my house Thursday at 5 o'clock and we'll discuss it. I did my homework. I showed up at his house. He did not trust me that I had read it, so he had me sit there and read it to him out loud. He explained to me that his job as my sponsor is to guide me through the process of the 12 steps that will put me in touch with a power greater than myself that will restore me to sanity, that will solve all my problems. He said, I'd be happy to sit here and talk to you and listen to you talk about what you think your problems are so that you will not share about them in the meetings. (laughs) He said, the meetings are for recovery from alcoholism, not about how your day went. I immediately informed him that they are breaking that rule down at the Alano Club right and left. (laughs) You know? (laughs) And we went through the process. And he, we read the book together. I read a page and he read a page. And I read a page and he, we read the entire book together. The stories and everything. The book is not 164 pages. It's a lot bigger than that. There's also this thing called the 12 and 12 that some people feel that isn't politically correct enough to read, which is really weird to me. You know, but we read all of this literature together. He was involved in general service. He took me into his life. He invited me into his Alcoholics Anonymous, and he was not afraid to give me his opinion about what was going on here. You can't find humility by pretending to be humble. You hear people in AA say, the longer I'm sober, the less I know. Don't you wonder about those people? (laughs) Aren't they paying attention? I mean, you can sit in meetings and not do a damn thing and pick some shit up, you know. You know, I mean, it's false humility couched in spiritual pride. Not cute. Not cute. I don't believe you when you say it, you know. You got to know something. I'm 23 years sober. I should know some stuff. You know, I should have picked up a few tricks along the way, you know. Virginia Woolf said, You can't find peace through avoiding life. You can't deepen emotionally by just figuring it out intellectually. You have to live through the experiences. If it's true that I'm powerless and my life is unmanageable, if that's really true, and the longer I'm sober, the depth of the meaning of powerlessness has taken on new dimensions. They just told us it was alcohol so they wouldn't scare the bejesus out of us, you know. But it's clear to me today in my life that I have no power over anything at all or anybody. Nothing. I have no power. So how could I possibly manage anything? Managers have power and authority. I have none. So I can't. This is good news, by the way. This is not bad news. 
Because even if I think I'm powerful and I can manage, the truth is I can't. So now I'm deluded on top of everything else. Therein lies my suffering, my inability to accept things the way they are. Pain is part of life. You lose people, people die, people reject you, things happen. Pain is part of life. You can't avoid pain, nor should you. Suffering, on the other hand, is kind of optional. You know, I can feel pain and then add to that suffering by feeling pain that I've lost somebody and then not accepting that that's the way that it is. The loss in and of itself is bad enough. You know, to wish it were different lasts even longer than the pain of loss. So if I can grasp this first step, the second step becomes operational. I need some power greater than myself that will restore me to sanity. Certainly enough sanity not to take the first drink, but also enough sanity to realize the depth of my powerlessness and my unmanageability. If I can grasp that, then what do you do? The third step, you turn your life and will over to it. What life and will? The fourth step. You can't do a third step without the fourth and the fifth step. And the life and will it's talking about is the resentments, the fears, and the broken relationships. The fifth step is the ceremony that we go through to show our sincerity. This is the time we actually do some work and we look at it and we go, these resentments, these fears, living in resentment and fear, here are the relationships that I bring to you today. How can I have healthy relationships when I'm filled with resentment and fear? It's not possible. The sixth and seventh step are two paragraphs in the book for good reason. There's nothing to do. I have not been empowered now, and I'm going to pick off my character defects one at a time. This week, we're going to work on sloth. <laughs> you know? <laughs> the character defects are well defined in the inventory. It's the fourth column of the resentment list my faults and mistakes. My faults and mistakes. There they are. I'm unforgiving, I'm prejudiced, I'm judgmental. I'm filled with anger and rage and all, all of the stuff, whatever it is unique to you that you come up with, that you can see in that fourth column. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a part in the resentment. I think that's a misnomer. I think it's my faults and mistakes. There can be many things that happened to me as a child that I played no part in, but if I'm still carrying it around when I'm 40 years old, my God, I'm unforgiving. How come I can't let go? Do I think I have some power over that? If I continue to hate that individual, somehow they'll feel it. You know? So we, at, we humbly ask. We become willing and we ask, please take these from me. I can't use them anymore. How does he take them? Well, he gives us, this manager gives us our first assignment. He says, make a list of people that you've injured and go about the process of paying back the money and making the apologies. So if I do that ninth step, am I now capable of intimacy? No. <laughs> no. One through nine is about 20%, maybe 15 to 20% of the program. That's it. It's just the beginning. It's sober 101. It's the first step. I mean, we're just even now. We're looking for the Academy Award, but we've just kind of gotten even, you know. I mean, other people do this as kind of a normal course of things, you know, and we've been saving this up. So now maybe we've got some self-esteem. You'll hear some people say, you've been your own worst enemy. Put yourself at the top of the amends list. That'll pretty much kill you. <laughs> you want to make amends to yourself? Put yourself at the bottom. By the time you get there, you'll have some self-esteem. Yeah. Isn't that how it works? I mean, really, isn't that how it works? The other thing you hear is people will sit there and say, take what you could use and leave the rest. Yeah. Give me that chicken gate, man. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that how you and I lived our lives, all of our lives? Aren't those days over now? I mean, the most spiritual thing you'll hear in Alcoholics Anonymous is get in the car. <laughs> yeah. Where are we going? What do you care? Get in the car. What's on your social calendar, you know? <laughs> so 10, 11, and 12, people call it the maintenance steps. Maintain what? What are we maintaining? 
Is it really just about not drinking? Really? You know, people, I hear people say, the longer I'm sober, the more I really realize it's just about not drinking. God, I hope not. I hope because I'm, I'm searching for something a little bit deeper, you know. I mean, i got to not drink so other things could come true in my life. But I want healthy relationships. I want to be healed sexually. I want to feel somebody in me, in my life. I want to be connected to other human beings on an in-depth level, even though I'm afraid of that. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I see in other people's lives, is I see that human connection that I have never had in my life, ever. And I now see that that may be possible. It may be possible for me to have these kinds of things. It may be possible for me to live a God-directed life. It might really be possible. Maybe that's why I was saved. My contention is that 10, 11, and 12 are 80 to 85% of the program. 10 says that I'm going to continue the inventory process, living the examined life. I have some awareness now. I can watch myself move through life. Maybe I can learn from that experience where I'm not just flotsam and jetsam and being blown around by breezes and shocked and stunned by chaos in my life. And people, well, God, who knew, you know? I had no idea. Well, you knew she was a stripper. What do you think she was going to do, man? God, pay attention. Pay attention, you know? You know, I mean, stuff like that, you know? I mean, it's like I'd like to be, like, conscious of stuff, you know, and aware so if I continue the inventory process and I see where I've done some damage, yeah, why not? The 11th step is the great journey in AA, trying to get close to whatever it is that saved my life. Because my life was saved. Are you conscious of that? That your life was saved. What a stunning experience. I mean, people pay big money for that. They look for that. They search all over the world. We got it for free. We, our lives got saved. The grace of God, whatever you call it, my life got saved. It would behoove me to get tight with the manager. You know? The 12th step is why I was saved. There is no other job in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is no other job in AA. There is no other action in AA. There's only one kind of 12-step work. There's not a bunch of different kinds. There's a big difference between activity and action. Is the activity bad? Of course not. It's being part of the community. And I've done a lot of that stuff, and there's a lot of stuff that I hope to do more of. I've been involved in general service and central service for years. You know, I've been on boards and things, and I've, I've swept floors, and I've cleaned coffee cups, and I've been the secretary and the treasurer, and I've done all that stuff because I love the AA community. I love it. I enjoy hanging out with you and yelling at you when you do stuff wrong and, and all that stuff. You know, I, I, I like it. But that is not in replacement of the action. Should everyone in AA sponsor? Absolutely. 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 And don't, don't fall victim to this thing. Well, I won't be your sponsor. There's too much ego in it. You can call me friend. Step up. <laughs> Step up. You know? Bill Wilson, Bill Wilson in the ninth concept says a very powerful thing. He says, let's not get too carried away with principles before personalities, lest we become mindless, faceless automatons. Every sponsor is a leader as well as a teacher. I was a year sober. I started sponsoring guys because that's what my sponsor told me to do. It's my understanding today when I see people in meetings that are constantly talking about how their day went and what's going on in their lives is they don't have a sponsor. And they use the meetings as a sponsor. They use the the meetings as a place. And Alcoholics Anonymous is a safe place. You can come here and say whatever you want. These are just my opinions, but they're really, really good ones. (laughs) You know? If I have a relationship with a sponsor and I'm sponsoring people, I have a place to go with this stuff. That's very real stuff. It's very real stuff. It shouldn't be made light of. There's stuff that goes on in my life. There's somebody that knows. I have had the same sponsor for 23 years. I don't want to break in a new one, you know. 
I started sponsoring people. So how does God work? He sends me you. He sends me you. Two rules. Always answer the phone. Get rid of caller ID. Stop controlling who comes into your life. You don't have the power. And you never have known what was good for you. So cut it out. (laughs) You know? You're using this finely tuned instrument to determine what you will and won't do and who you will and won't interact with. And you, if you're anything like me, will never consciously put yourself in an uncomfortable position. And if you're not in an uncomfortable position, nothing's happening in your life. You know? So he sends me you. Rule number two, never say no. For some altruistic reason, no, not really. Because you need to go places where you're going to have new experiences that you wouldn't in and of yourself choose to do. Because we are looking for the comfort zone. Other people find themselves in ruts. They climb out of it. Alcoholics furnish them. You know? I need something that's going to drag me up out of the rut and take me places. A couple of quick stories. <clears throat> I used to stand up at these podiums and I'd say that if you were on medication, you weren't sober. You know why I said that? Because I heard some of you say that. And it seemed like a really good right-wing badass attitude to have, you know? Kind of the old biker in me, go, yeah, let's piss some people off, you know. That seems like we're, yeah, yeah, you know. I'll, well, <laughs> here, the, <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty arrogant, if you've noticed, but I have limitations, you know. <laughs> and for me to put myself in the position to determine whether you're correctly alcoholic enough for me to work with is just a place I'm not willing to go, you know. But I used to stand up and say that. Then this guy walks up to me and he says, will you be my sponsor? I go, he says, but I think I should tell you that I'm bipolar and I'm on medication. I went, geez, one of these losers, you know. But I have a rule. Never say no, ever, 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 you know. So I said, well, okay. So I start reading the book with this guy, right? <clears throat> and I had the experience of peeling him off the ceiling and lifting him up off the floor One time, he's a 40-year-old grown man. One time, he came across my living room, curled himself up in my lap, put his face in my neck, and cried like a baby. That will get your attention. (laughs) You know? So now when I see that guy come and I look at him and go, have you taken your medication? (laughs) Because you have issues. You know, have you had your blood levels checked lately? You know, you can kind of, sometimes if he's not doing well, you can feel him 20 feet away. You know, it's like, you know, I had another guy walk up to me and say, will you be my sponsor? He says, I think I should tell you that I'm gay. And I said, well, wouldn't you rather have a gay sponsor? He looked at me and he says, no, he says, I don't have any problem being gay, but drinking is an issue. <laughs> I guess I had that confused. (laughs) Sometime later, I said, how come you don't go to gay meetings? He goes, I'm going to tell you this one more time. I'd like to close with a quick story. I'm I'm okay, aren't I? Okay. Uh, One quick quick story that and I, I get carried away and, and, and I, but I want to tell you one thing that really is important to me especially around my birthday I told you I hated my father when I was a year sober and he was 70 years old I went to his house and I made amends to him and I don't know that I really felt it but I knew that this thing that was eating me up inside had to be dealt with and, uh, and I went to him and I uh, I told him, I'm sorry that I wasn't the son that I, want, I know you wanted me to be. I should have never said those horrible things to you. And you're, you're my father, and I love you. And I don't, I don't want to hate you anymore. I'm pooped, you know. And uh, I drove home that night, and I could feel something reach down inside me and pull that anger out of me. Maybe not all of it, but a really good hunk. I mean, it was an experience I will never forget. And my heart wasn't even in the right place. You know, please don't wait for good motivations to do things. We've never had a good motivation, you know. And if we're going to grow up, if we're going to grow up and deepen emotionally, we're going to have to put ourselves in these situations. 
Time went on, and my dad and I, his birthday was March the 28th, mine was March the 27th. For 14 years, we gave each other birthday cakes in the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag. It was the Gordon and Bill show, and I fell in love with my father. I found my daddy. Was he Ward Cleaver? No. (laughs) He was my father, and I got to see the AA side of him. I got to see the man side of him standing outside the men's stag at the Alano Club telling dirty jokes and stuff. I'd never seen that with him. I'd never seen him be a regular guy, you know, just a man. He said some of the funniest things I've ever heard in Alcoholics Anonymous. And people loved him in the men's stag. He was sober a long time, and he loved AA. He never stopped loving AA. He always loved Alcoholics Anonymous. And he got cancer. He was 85 years old. He decided that he wasn't going to do the chemotherapy. And we went for the ride. And you all were there. We brought up meetings to the house. And he was in a hospital bed in the living room. And my mother and I took care of him. And one afternoon, we're standing there, and it was time to, time to change the diapers. And there wasn't, hospice wasn't there. It was just her and I. And she looked at me, and she goes, well, here we go. And I got to see my parents as lovers. She had seen his butt many times in 62 years. You know, They were married 62 years. And we changed my father's diaper, and it was one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced, not because of the physicality of it, but just the loving, lovingness of it. The way that you've loved me, the way that I've loved you, you've taken me into your lives to places I'd never wanted to go. You know, I've watched you, I've watched you with your children when your children have died. I've been there when that's happened. I've been to your weddings, and I've been to your divorces, and I've, and I've been there when your children were born. By the time this happened to me when my father got cancer, I was ready. I'd seen the face of death. I'd been in hospitals. I'm not afraid to go. My sponsor went with me. He helped me through these things. He helped me grow up and see life for what it really is. A veil of tears? No, but it has pain in it. But a real full life. My dad passed away, and we had a great memorial for him. My mother moved in with Karen and I, and then she got cancer. And one day I was standing by the side of her bed, and it was time to change the diapers. And there was no one else in the room. It was just her and I. And she looked at me and she said, I never raised you to do this. And I said, oh, yes, you did. I remember what you were doing in that house when I was growing up. You were saving those people's lives. I know what you were doing now because I have a home like that now. I have a home with the weird uncles and the weird aunts and all of that, you know. And all the Al-Anons were there. This one little Al-Anon woman took me in the back of the house one day. She says, are you okay? And I went, oh, yeah, I'm all right. She said, are you sure? And I went, oh, no, I'm not okay, you know. And they held me, and they always bring food, you know. So my mother was laying there in the bed, and, and, and and she had thought she'd lost her dignity. And I said, I know what you were doing in that house. You did raise me to do this, so roll over. (laughs) And I changed her diapers. And the second time, it was a little easier. And the third time, she goes, Bill, it's time. (laughs) And we passed a threshold, didn't we? We went into another world that we didn't know was available to us. And I helped carry my mother's light into the other room, and I was there when she passed away. So was Karen. I love AA. I love you. And I really mean that. I love it here. What a wonderful life. I get to travel around and meet all of you and see different places. And I'll tell you something. Alcoholics Anonymous is as alive and well and effective as it has ever been. Don't believe anybody that tells you that we've lost our edge. Where there's good sponsorship, there's good AA. Where there's bad sponsorship, there's bad AA. So go out there and make it good. God bless you.